Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traversing the Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. We have an amazing show for you all because boarding the mothership is Matt Kent. You know him as the co-creator of Berserker with Keanu Reeves. He is now the creator of the Flux House imprint from Dark Horse Comic Books. Now come join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Hello, Mr. Kent. Thank you so much for coming to the Traversing the Stars podcast. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of yours. I really love your series, Berserker. It's absolutely phenomenal. Thanks. I'm, I'm only partially responsible, but I'll, I'll take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I mean, you you're definitely are a significant part of it. And like I said, it's a fantastic story. Thanks. <laughs> so I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired you to become a writer and who were your earliest influences? Okay, yeah. I, uh, as far as inspiration goes, man, I, don't, I just write all the time. I remember being a kid, we would go to, um, we lived in a small town, so we didn't really have a bookstore. So we'd have to drive into the city to go to the big bookstore, which is like Walden Books or B. Dalton, whatever the, the mall bookstores were. Hmm. And my mom would be like, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but my mom would be like, whatever, any books you want, you, you can get any books you want, you know? So we'd go in there and I would look immediately. I just went to the science fiction aisle, you know, it's like, I knew exactly where it was. And, and I would pick out a few books and, and, and so while we didn't have a lot of money, we had a seemingly unlimited budget for books and art supplies. And that was the thing that sort of stuck with me is my parents were very good about like encouraging us to read and then create, you know, it's like any, like um, we didn't, they, they didn't buy us a lot of toys or frivolous stuff or like, you know what I mean? I got, my jeans were like, I had iron on patches over the knees, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we had, I had all the books and art supplies I, I ever wanted. And um, so I, I really credit that. And like, so my earliest influences were like all like sci-fi, Arthur C. Clarke and, and uh, Heinlein and Philip K. Dick and um, uh, Ray Bradbury and, and all those guys, you know, were, were just super early influences. Your parents sound awesome. I like the idea of unlimited uh, funds for books. I mean, that's the way it should be. <laughs> that, that is amazing. No, it stuck with me. Like our daughter, she's 19 now, but that I, it stuck with me so much that I always, I don't know that my parents ever verbalized that, you know, and I guess they did because it, it, that's what it was. But I always told our daughter, I was like, any, any books, any art, anything you need, uh, like, don't even, you don't even have to ask. <laughs> but, but I feel like that's great because you, like, it just points kids in the right direction, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, then there's no limits there, you know, and, and uh, there's whatever, you make it work. So, so when did the comic book bug bite you? Mm. Comic books was my brother. I had an older brother who was into comics and he was buying all these books. And then he had it in his closet, because he's sliding doors for his closet. So you, you'd slide open the door and he had a shelf in there. And on his shelf, he had his stacks of comics. This is before there weren't boxes. I don't know. We didn't have a comic shop. So there were no, there weren't boxes or bags or boards or any of that stuff. So he had them all stacked. Um, in a row like mostly x-men like in order perfectly stacked on these shelves in his closet um and i wasn't allowed in his room of course so i would sneak in there and then i would go into his closet and look at his comics and but mm. his comics were so perfectly stacked he could tell when i was in there so i kept getting into trouble because <laughs> he didn't want me touching any of his stuff um <laughs> so eventually i got i talked my parents into getting me like a subscription so i got like whatever marvel you fill up a little thing and they mm. you know you got like four or five books like peter parker and daredevil <laughs> and that kind of thing so i i uh i was reading that stuff growing up and then uh it wasn't until i was older when i got into college i was going to art school and i i like writing i like drawing but i was, I was like the kind of books i want to do they don't really uh they don't exist and there's like how am i going to make a living doing that there's just no it seemed like there's no audience for what I wanted to do. I couldn't figure it out. So I was mm. kind of quit. I was going to quit reading comics. And I remember finding eight ball, like the first three issues of eight ball had come out in the nineties. And uh, I was reading those and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is what, this is what I want to do. I can do this. Like there's a viable um, way for me to tell the stories I want to tell, which are not superheroes. And it's mm. not 
it's not slice of life or autobiographical, you know, it's, it's something weird and sort of pulpy and, and it can be a little strange. And, um, and so that sort of inspired me to try to figure out my own path, you know, and my own kind of stories and own kind of art. So when you were caught going through your brother's comic books, were, were there some beatings uh, wrapped up in this? And was it totally worth it? Oh, yeah, yeah we fight all the time. Yeah, well, when I was younger, too, so I would cry. And then my mom would get uh, mad at my brother. You know, my brother always took the fall. <laughs> He'd always be in trouble. He's like, why did you make your brother cry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you got to be very defensive of one's comic books. They're, they're, they're gold. Yeah. <laughs> no what's funny is what drove my brother crazy too is like he always said i had grubby hands you know because i was a, well i was a dirty kid but yeah um he was younger and it was whatever and a uh, sweaty probably and uh so i did i would get my comics and then he it would drive him crazy because he was very like um whatever he just was very particular about how he took care of his things and i would go i would wake up in the morning and i would be on top of gi joe number one the cover came i remember the cover came off because oh no but I would, I would read till I fall asleep. And so they're just on my bed, you know, and my comic store is getting rolled on over oh, on, no. and uh, drove, drove them crazy. And um, I was like, I don't know. For me, comic books have, have always been like a, like a thing to use. You know? <laughs> like I never really collected, collected. Like I, like all the books, all the comics I have now, everything I had since I was a kid has been, I hardcover bound it into these. Let's see if I can. I don't have one here. Oh, it's sitting on the <laughs> under my lap. But I had them bound in these. Look, this is audio only. You can't see. Oh it, but wow! I'll, I'll show you. This is a this is Daredevil. Whatever. One eighty to two hundred five. So this is the ones I had when I was a kid, and it's all. I'm oh flipping, man! All the old comics. But it's all the ads, the covers, everything's in there. They still smell good. <laughs> but it's like a it's like a hardcover black, just a plain black cover that looks good on the shelf, you know, and um. So that's that's where my comics are now. They're they're taken care of. You, you know, you may have divided our audience on this one. So half of them are probably <laughs> like, that bounty looks really awesome, and, they, and it does. The other half is like, no, I'm signing with the brother. You don't screw with comic books. <laughs> there's there's a, there comes a point in every person's life where you're like, am I gonna sell these books or are these books for me to enjoy? You know, and I got to the point where I was like, well, I'm not. I'm never selling these. Like, I'm just gonna enjoy them and I'll enjoy them how I want to, which is take them off the shelf, flip through them anytime I want. The, the, the binding is awesome, though. That that looks like those old, classic old books. And if you open up the comic books, I, I love that. That looks really awesome. No, it's great. I have like, I probably have like 200 of them. And it looks like I have a fancy law library, you know, like I'm this <laughs> well-versed person of letters. <laughs> with comic books. Yeah, which is even better than letters, aren't, aren't they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So in, in July, um, you're going to launch your new creator owned imprint called Flux House uh, through Dark Horse Comics. So I mean, you've been in the business for a while now. Why was now the right time to launch the imprint? And how long have you been planning to do this for? Yeah, well, now's the right time because I was bored. I've been in this industry too long. So I, I, I'm like, kind of, it's kind of a joke, kind of not. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I, I got to the point where I want to do, I'm tired of just doing regular monthly comics that come out in the right normal way. And, and then they collect it into the book and the books looks normal. And, and I think, I don't know, I get boxes of comps of my books when they come out. And, and there was a point where I would get the box and you open it and you're all excited. It's like, oh, here's the, the book. And then there was a point where I stopped being excited. I stopped getting that thrill when I opened the box and then see my books. And then now it was a point where I was like, I wasn't even opening them. I was like, oh, I know that's whatever that book is. And it would just sit there. And I was like, well, this, that's a problem. <laughs> like, I want to be excited to mm. pull the book out and feel it, touch it, look at it, flip through it and everything. And so um, I decided I needed to fix that. Not, I needed to fix it for myself. And so I want to be excited when those books are printed and they come out. I want it to be something where I'm a little nervous, like, did it turn out right? You know, like mm. we're picking different paper and different cover stocks. And then um, we're doing some things like magazine formatted. So they're slightly larger um, and th some things with fold outs and um, the mind management that's coming out in July, they were poly bagging it with a card and the poly bag has like a cutout, like it's, it's bright fluorescent pink. And then there's a cutout that reveals like the logo. Um, but there's all kinds of uh, things I had to figure out with the, uh, with the cover because that you're revealing the I have to have the title and the number and the UPC code show through the bag, but the covers the front covers are variants by different artists, um, 
and I and my direction to them was don't do do a cover that is like nothing you've ever done. Don't worry about the logo. Don't worry about um, anything. I just come up with something the craziest thing you can think of, you know, and that's what we'll do. And so we did. And the problem is then like the logo is all over either not there or somewhere weird or they hand drawn or, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. something every cover was, wouldn't fit the poly bag with the cutout for the logo. It's like, Oh, <laughs> I got to figure something out. So I drew back covers, like I custom drew back covers with the logo in the center. Um, and so, uh, it was like extra stuff I had to do sort of last minute because the production wouldn't work. And then we had to make sure that they bagged them backwards. <laughs> so the back cover is actually serving as a front cover when mm. it's going to be on the shelf. Um, anyway, it's to me, it's like fun stuff like that where now I'm excited. I'm a little mm. nervous <laughs> that it's going to turn out all right. You know, in uh, I have another book uh, reprint. We're doing a reprint of, um, it hasn't been announced yet. Um, it's a spy book. I won't say what the title is, but the, Dust jacket is um, uh, has die cut holes that reveal the title of the book, but then there's a bunch of extra uh, X's on the on the dust jacket that are designed so if I sign your book, I'm going to punch out holes mm. and it'll reveal secret codes on the back. Oh, that's awesome! So there's like a bunch of letters all over the book, but getting designing that so that it would line up and so I could have different there's maybe ten or twenty different uh, secret messages depending on what I punch out. Mm. I had to make it so it, all of them worked. You know, it was just kind of like a, it was like a little bit of a puzzle to figure out the design of it. But, but um, we're doing, we're just kind of doing things like that where uh, it makes me nervous. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> and I'm real excited to open the box because I want to see if it, if it worked out or. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I mean, it's great that this uh, company is helping you to um, reinvigorate your love for comic books again. And it just, seem like you're finding new ways to make them interesting for people. I do like the idea of the codes and everything else. We'll go into a little more detail on what you're doing special with the comic books in a bit. Um, one thought question I was thinking of, obviously a lot of our fan base, uh, they'll know you from something like Berserk or things of that nature. Since you're creating multiple titles for um, Flux House, the, sort, the sort, comic books you're working on now, are they still going to keep going? Are they being shut down in favor of Flux House? Um, no, everything, I'm, everything that's currently coming out or about to come out or it's, it hasn't changed anything. Um, Flux House for me is just a way to uh, work on my new books and then do these books in a way where I have total control of everything. So I'm designing the books. I get to control like the size and the, the production and just everything about it. Um, but yeah, it's not going to affecting, I mean, Berserker, we're still writing the last two issues of that. So um, we're uh, still working hard on that. And, uh, what else am I working on? I'm doing a bunch of bad idea books. So <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> so when you talk to Dark Horse Comic Books about the idea of your imprint and you sold it as, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but we're going to give it a shot. Was, was Dark Horse like, oh, fantastic. No, that's, not, that's, not how, that's not at all how you pitched this idea. That's not at all how I pitched it. I can talk about it now. But right, right. No, you pitched it with full confidence. That like, hey, we're going to do something new, completely different, that, but it's 100% going to work. <laughs> like, don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, no, I, uh, they, I've been working with Dark Horse for a long time and, and then my editor, Daniel there and, and, uh, and then Mike Richardson, who's been running the company, he has been like a backer and support of my work from since before I even know who he was like, mm. like behind the scenes, he was <laughs> helping me out. I didn't know it. Um, so yeah, when I, I pitched this idea, I had the whole line, I had a line of books and I had mocked up the covers and descriptions of everything and sort of, um, I sort of like glaze over some of the production <laughs> stuff nobody, nobody needs to know that like i'll figure it out you don't need to know that part um but just know that the, the stories are going to be good we have like crime stories sci-fi like spies there's a horror it's like an evil cat horror story we're doing so um it's all like stuff you want to read it's mm. just how we're delivering it is going to be like more a little more interesting and more fun to like hold in your hand so Mr. Richardson's probably watching now going, son of a bitch. Wait wait till after the imprint's already, it's too late to go back now. <laughs> yeah. No, no, he knows, he knows what I'm doing. He, he, back when I first launched my management, he, I had pitched it to Dark Horse and uh, they're like, no, we're not, we don't, we're not doing really monthly comics right now. We just want graphic novels and that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. um, 
and then Mike called me up out of the blue later and he's like how come we're not doing your next book and I was like well <laughs> I pitched this like 56 issue ongoing monthly where I do everything and he's like approved <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> like, so he if anybody's uh, as crazy as me it's probably him you know or at least he has, he has trust in me to at least execute it but um yeah I'm not it helps to know the boss that. right yeah i guess so <laughs> <laughs> but like i said that's awesome and I, like i said i like that you're expressing yourself creatively using a uh, flux house so uh, other than the ones you've mentioned uh what other kind of experimentation are going to be going through with some of these comic books that are going to make it unique fun i know some of what i've read is that some of the comic books are not going to fit the standard comic book size um books either um how's that going to work are you going to be provide you know like how are you going to handle the, the larger comic books yeah, as well gonna, i'm not going too crazy i and i don't want to like scare every retailer into not ordering <laughs> anything you know so we but we're doing what the monthly books are going to be standard size but there's going to be a handful of them that are going to be magazine size. So like think about Savage sort of Conan, Epic or Heavy Metal. Mm. Um, they're going to be like that format. And um, a few of those will be that way. And it's it's with artists I've worked before, but like Wilfredo Torres, who I did bang with, and then David Rubin, who everybody knows. And, and then uh, um, we, uh, we're just, they're excited to work in a larger format. And seeing mm. that, giving them the extra space is just, it makes it different. It makes it seem bigger and more important. And then the paper is going to be great. And, and, uh, and then you can still get your magazine CGC if you want to get it slabbed. I, we're going to well, have fun with the covers and everything. It's going to be hopefully uh, not dissuade people from getting in. I think uh, magazine size people are, it's not that uncommon. Like I have, I got a bunch of epic magazines over here. I love looking at them. <laughs> so I, mean, I read somewhere, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that some of the covers are gonna be uh, fake fur covers. Now, I've never even heard of something like that before. Is that like, where's, I mean, I heard of metal covers. I've heard of like the embossed covers. How did you find a fur of, or fake fur covered printer? You would be surprised. Like if you ask printers, they wanna do, they wanna do crazy stuff. You know, <laughs> so all you gotta do is be like, what do you got? Like what's the craziest thing you don't get to do? And so that's kind of what we did is I, um, even with with Dark Horse and everybody that's working on these books with me, the production, the editorial there, I just up front, I was like, look, we, every one of these books, let's think, let's start from the ground up and think um, if we did it that way before, let's not do it that way this time, you know, or if we're doing it that way this time, let's figure out why, mm. like, let's understand that we are repeating something. Um, so with this, it was the same. It was like, what, what can the printers do, you know, and like the print buyers, everybody, the production people at Dark Horse, they, everyone's excited because we don't everything's like kind of the same every month and and that's if i'm bored other people are bored mm. like we're all we're all doing the same thing all the time uh, let's let's mix it up so yeah we sourced the uh the fur they had different samples of different fur and everything there's like different colors and like and uh i was amazed i was like how are there <laughs> what are you, who else is doing this why does this exist right but, right <laughs> But uh, yeah, I got to, I actually had to samples. I had to pick like the correct fur, you know, and, uh, but uh, yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's interesting. It's because it's like you're a fashion designer, you know, going through the different fabrics, you know, I like this one that goes, you know, I mean, it adds a, a new layer of artistic expression in a comic book. I think it's really yeah, cool. I'm, I'm trying to keep it story driven too. So like that's that one, it's not just a fur cover, like, one of my favorite artists is Marcel Duchamp, who's like this French guy, whatever. One of the pieces he did, I think this is him. It was a, a plate, a plate in a teacup or something covered with fur, like fur covered. And that's like, it's in the museum, it's on a pedestal. Mm. I was like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> this is covered in fur. So, but I want to take, I want to channel that sort of energy, mm. but then apply it to a narrative, you know, and like have it be, there's a reason for it, you know? And so when you're holding that book, and it's about this cat who may or may not be evil. I'm not going to spoil it, uh, but definitely like fires and people die and this thing. Um, may maybe because of the cat, maybe not. But but I want you to when you're holding it to like uh, halfway through the book, you're kind of creeped out that you're holding a book that's got fur on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Like it's going to change in your hand as you're reading it because of the book, because of the story. Mm. Um, and I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to figure out a way to do that with every book in some way, like. Fur cover is like the flashiest version, but some of it's more a little more subtle. Yeah, 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 I really like it that it's not only that you're coming up with ways to 
be different with art, but that it's actually directly connected to the comic book that you're doing it with. So it's not just random. It's a story, you know, with a cat. So you have the fur, it's not just randomly choosing, oh, let's just do this. It, it's it's or, organic to the concept. I yeah, think that's, yeah, that, no, that's really good. a cool thing. Even like we're doing the poly bag and like we're putting a little playing card in every mind management issue, um, which is like ulti- the ultimate gimmick, right? Like if you grew up in the 90s, mm. like I did reading comics, it was like everything was poly bagged and had a yep. card or something. I was like, well, that's to me, that was like a conscious decision for that book because it made sense with the story inside mm. and, and then the playing card and how that's going to interact with you. Um, it's not just a card. You know what I mean? I throw that stuff away. Like I care less. <laughs> you know because i'm not a collector right right, right, right. but like everything i'm doing that's like that it's not it's not to collect it's it's so it like helps you like interact with the story in some way and so like those cards are going to be something that you can use outside of the book but also adds a little layer of Mm. paranoia to uh, (laughs) to everything (laughs) (laughs) so the first as you mentioned the first book being launched by flux house is going to be my management bootleg yeah which um so my management bootleg is that that's a continuation of the original My Management comic book that you've been um, very famous for having done? I think it was 35 issues series. Yeah, yeah, 36 issues over three years. And then uh, I think it was like 10 years ago now, but this is definitely not, it's a standalone thing. And I know everybody says, oh, this is a good jumping on point. Um, and it's always a lie. <laughs> because I want you to buy the new thing. Um, this is very much a... Uh, good jumping on point standalone thing like you can go back and read it if you like this go back and read the other one if you've read mm. the other stuff this is you're going to recognize some things in there but it's not essential like mm. it's definitely its own thing with four new characters that we introduce one in every issue um and it sort of introduces you to the concept of mind management in a new from a different angle um but yeah it's definitely i didn't want to do a prequel i didn't want to do a sequel i didn't want to i feel like the 36 issues i did um that's it's that's a thing it that is his own thing you know and if i'm going to do something new or something related to it i wanted it to be something different so mm. it's part of the reason why i brought in other artists is so that uh, and the title's bootleg so i wanted to almost feel like i was like did matt approve these artists like is this <laughs> like a, an official mind management product or is it like not <laughs> right, <laughs> so right right right. <laughs> i wanted to sort of feel like uh i was like maybe this maybe i didn't um consent <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome story. So um, mind management was, um, it completed about seven years ago. Why now did you decide it's time to revisit those stories? Was there something that popped into your head that you thought, you know, it's time to see these characters, this world again, it's been a while. Well, a few things, it was like a confluence of a few things. One is we had done um, a board game last year, mind management board game. So that sort of forced me to get get back in the world and research it and like look up things the game designers were asking me all these questions about like what's what's psychic uh note paper and all these things i was like i don't remember that was like <laughs> was like years ago in 36 issues um, so i had to go back and sort of like research my own work and sort of uh analyze and look at what i had done so we can make this board game because the board game has like 14 little mini comics that sort of tie into this the well, that's game cool. or its own story um, so that was its own, that was a special project. So I was doing that. And at the same time, my management got option for TV. So I'm working on a uh, pilot and trying to figure out, develop, how do you develop this into a television, you know, in different ways to do that. Um, so that was all happening all at the same time. And I was like, well, maybe, I was like, why don't we do, I was wanting to do Flux House. And I was like, why don't we just launch with a title that people are familiar with? Something mm. that um, if you're a fan of the stuff, like you'll be excited. It's like, oh, this is, it seemed like a good launch title um, that could introduce people to mind management, but also be like, I was like, hey, if you, um, if you remember it, <laughs> here's a little more with a little bit of a twist. So mm. it, it made sense to me that I was already kind of immersed in the world again, uh, not through my own uh, decision, but because of the board game and the other, other mm. stuff. So I was like, well, and, that, and then it gave me an idea. I was like, oh, there's a way things are different. Like that was, what, if you said seven years ago, is that how long it? Yeah, things are a little bit different now too. So I, I I feel like it's relevant in some ways, and in other ways, it was giving me ideas to sort of do a modern, a more modern story that has like a whatever. There's there's like a thousand times more cell phones than when I first started that <laughs> book. So so it sort of changes things. So like I said, because it was seven years ago, um, obviously you've changed as an individual. You've grown. 
um, became hopefully wiser, I, I, I assume, um, at least more, definitely more experienced. How do you think that time from how you ended, when you ended my management in 2015 to now, changed how you're approaching this world and these characters again? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I had to be careful that, um, because with distance comes understanding for me of my books. Like I think mm -hmm. while I'm doing them, um, and even when they're done, I'm not fully sure what they're about. You know, like I like I never pitched a book to an editor where I was like, hey, this book is about blah, 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 our modern society and how we're like addicted to it, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've never ever thought about a story that way or pitched a story that way because I don't know, like, I, I don't think that way. I think about characters and I have like fun little ideas for like quirky little things, you know, and then figure out a way to t weave a narrative around it. So it isn't until I'm done with the book that I sit back um, and I don't ever reread. I've never reread any of my books. <laughs> so yeah. I don't, but I, what happens is they get reflected back to me from other, from people that have read them, you know, or like, and they'll, they'll tell me what it means or they'll, <laughs> that's and it's cool. always something different. I was like, well, that's, that's not all, but <laughs> I was like, I like that idea. I think that's a good take. I was like, that's not my intent, you know? And so a lot of times that'll happen or, or like, or you'll start to see, you know, how, how people have perceived it in a different way, um, which is fascinating to me. And so I feel like um, the danger for me in doing this was, uh, uh, am I writing this in a way that is, is reacting to people's reaction to the book? Mm. Or is it, or is it just from me? Or is it my, my, the meaning I put in the book carrying forward? And um, I think it's a little bit of all of those, you know, there's no way to put that much distance between you without being conscious of what people think about it, you know, and then sort of either playing off of that or trying to go against that, you know, usually for, for me, it's like, oh, going against, <laughs> I'd rather push against something. So, so how would that change the concept, whether it was done based on the reaction or done because of how you felt about the stories? Would, would that, would that fundamentally have changed how this was, combo was going to happen? Yeah, I and I don't even know. I'm not sure how it's how it's changed it. I think having other artists draw it um, fundamentally changed it because I had to write in a different way and explain things a little more and be a little more precise and and um, at least my intent. You know, where if I'm drawing, writing, and drawing it, I can be I can be a little more vague. Or uh, but with the artists, they had to know like kind of what they were doing. You know. <laughs> and, uh, so it made me nail that down a little bit more. And uh, I don't know, you know, I haven't, the thing is like, I haven't, uh, once I read the lettered uh, issue with the art, uh, then I don't, I never look at it again. So even now I I, I can't tell you what it's about other than <laughs> there's there's like a meme in there that is uh, kind of like contagious. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to, I asked, I asked all the artists, I asked my niece, I asked my daughter, I, I was like, help me come up with a meme. Like I need an image that we can, that we, we can use with multi-purpose and nobody could do it. I was like, it was kind of hard to come up with something. And then finally, Matt Lesniewski, who's, who's, he drew issue three, two or three, he drew two or three. I can't remember which issue it was. I think it was the second one. He, um, he, he finally nailed it. He came up with something. It's like this creepy smiling cat that, uh, that we're using as sort of the meme. That's um, awesome. Kind of thing, but yeah, it was hard. So, so having these other artists come on board to draw your baby, because it was—I mean, you drew the baby for thirty-six issues. Was it weird to let somebody else handle your baby like that? And when you chose these other artists, did you choose the ones that kind of matched the style of the original, or just people you wanted to work with? Yeah, I think uh, it was hard to let go of it, but I also I purposely wrote this knowing it could be its own thing. And so there's four new characters and they're characters I've never drawn. So like the main characters in each issue you get introduced to are brand new. And I felt like that helped me because I was like, well, you're not drawing like Maru or Henry Lime, even though the spoiler, they're, they're kind of in there. And so, but it was kind of fun then to sort of put them in and then see how the, each artist sort of handled mm. that character. It was kind of fun to me. It's almost <laughs> like, it's like getting a commission, right? Like you, right commission an artist like oh do me who do I want you to draw you know so it was like kind of that so it was like it was kind of fun to see their takes mm. on the familiar characters but then I also made it easy that the main characters were 
completely new um, and helped me let go of it a little bit. But so, so what can the listeners expect from my management bootleg? I mean, um, stylistically, still going to follow the same feel of the original series and like um, con- story based, like kind of where can they expect it to head? Yeah, you. Uh, I would say my my goal with the original series was to make sure you got your money's worth. So when you buy one issue, it's like four dollars. It's going to take you long, more than ten minutes to get through it. So we're doing the same thing. That was that for me is the bar. It's like I want you to at least spend like twenty minutes looking at this book. <laughs> so so how do we do that? Well, you do it with like a lot of things, like a lot of different layers. Like there's no ads in the book. Just like the original series didn't have ads. This one. It has ads, but they're not, they're not real <laughs> ads, but uh, and it has a lot of uh, design elements in it. There's a, um, like I would say, don't trust anything in this book or don't take <laughs> anything at face value, like the inside cover, the indicia, mm. the copyright stuff. Don't look at everything, <laughs> you know, and then, and then doubt it too, that doubt what you're reading. Mm. Um, but uh, there's a, and I did a, I did a backup story that's going to be in each issue that we didn't really announce. Um, uh that i did i'm using a pen name for because i'm doing a kind of a different style different color and mm. and it's it's like a sort of a strange it's if you've read the original series there's a there's a sequence in there towards the end where salvador dali is directing a sequel to um double indemnity which is a classic film noir movie mm. and he's, he's directing the sequel called triple indemnity which is funny to me <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so I thought, I was like, oh, I want to do, I want to do something that sort of ties into the main narrative of the story, which um, there's a mini comic. This is like, none of this is going to make any sense <laughs> until you read it. Trust me, it will make sense. But there's a mini comic that the, the kid in the first issue gets recruited with. It's a mind management mini comic. And it's based on this black cat character who's like a golden age um, superhero girl who rides on a motorcycle. You can find them, they're public domain now anyway. Mm. Um, so it's sort of based on that. Um, so I thought it would be fun to do the mini comic that he gets recruited with, do that as the com- the backup comic in the in the series. So I I sort of drew that <laughs> mini cool. comic using a pen name, um, but the story within that mini comic is a prequel to Double Indemnity called Indemnity. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb but it's like whatever <laughs> alien aliens <laughs> right, right. but i mean it, it just sounds so awesome and i think it sounds even cooler that there is a board game based on a comic book and i you know i kind of i guess maybe just some growing up and playing board games for some reason like in my head they just seem to spring out of like nowhere where you're just kind of like hey look a board game i don't like ever think about how it actually came together so how does a, a board game from a comic book what, how did that happen like how did you think about when you saw your combo this would be a perfect board game yeah here's the thing so five years ago i was tagging along with a friend of mine brian hurt who does comics six gun blah 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 we're we're friends and uh, we share a studio so he was going to gen con uh to support like a role-playing game based on six gun yeah. and, was, and he wanted somebody to tag along i was like okay I'll, tag, I'll bring my work and work in the hotel and you go do your game thing or whatever and and then, uh, so I did that. And then I was like, but I, he's like, hey, you should come down and just look around. So I was like, oh, I'll come down. I don't know anything about the fandom or board, mm. board games. I just remember my brother trying to get me to play like Catan, you know, 15 years ago. And mm. all I wanted to do is play his Xbox because I didn't have one, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay. So I went down there and I looked and I walked in. And it was just, it was like giant convention, comic book style convention but it was board games all over the place it was like what in the world is going on there's this game cthulhu wars which is these big plastic miniatures of like cthulhu monsters and it was a, those were the pieces for the board That's game. awesome and i was like what's that like, <laughs> and i immediately bought it i was like i don't care what the game is like i'm gonna buy this because those <laughs> things look cool and uh and then i that was at the very front of the convention and by the time i'd walked around the the whole place my brain was rewired rewired like i was like this is this is my hobby like i just find <laughs> a hobby and I, I went home with like a trunk full of board games That's but awesome. during that during that convention i uh brian was talking to some of the game people and, and then i met um jay cormier and, and sen who who co-designed the game um they were at the only booth and 
and uh, Jay was like, hey, Brian introduced me, and Jay's like, oh, I love my management, and I was like, we should do a board game. <laughs> I literally know only from the door to that booth is all I knew about games. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we should do a board game. He's like, oh, okay. He's like, we should. I was like, all right, just email me, and we'll figure something out, and then like two years of development, you know, is what it took mm. for them to design the mechanics of the game to figure out how it worked and then and then explain it to me i was like how <laughs> i was like okay you're gonna have to really spell it out like because i don't know anything about the design the game design part so they they were really good about like walking me through it all and telling me like what art they needed and i was like let's just treat the game like there's no art budget you know because i'll just do it we'll, whatever we'll split the kickstarter and and uh and i'll just load it with art and i'll do like mini comics it'll have like there's all kinds of secret stuff. If you think the comics had secret stuff, that game has more <laughs> things hidden in it than anything I've ever done. Um, but yeah, it was just like a lot of work. And um, anyway, it turned out crazy and cool. It's like one of my things I'm most proud of. Well, the important question is, can you win in that game? Are you good at it? I'm, t- I'm so bad. I'm so bad. <laughs> That's funny. I'm s- so bad at it. No. But. <laughs> I'll play it. I know how it works. I just don't know. <laughs> well, was it hard determining the rules of a, of a game like that? Because once again, there's always nuances in the rules and ways for players to be like, well, I don't know. This is kind of vague. How, how, how hard was it to develop a good set of rules and concepts that players could, you know, understand and, and play? And play? That means be a hard balance between, you know, co- you got to be a certain level of comp- complexity, but it can't be, you know, that they can't figure it out at all either. Yeah, it's tough. And like, I don't know, like I've, this is like five years ago. I'm so into board games now. Like I know like all the, how they all work and like, mm. and uh, what my favorite ones are. And, but I know at the time it, that's the hardest part, right. Is like, not just the rules, but like, okay, here's, here's the premise for the game. Here are the rules for the game. And then you have, it's just like months and months of play testing where you have people that haven't ever played it before playing it to see if they can break it like mm, is there like a loophole in the rules or is there something you can do that <laughs> sort of breaks the game and so they you just have people do that endlessly and then you're constantly finding problems with it and then trying to fix it and then if you fix it then that's a ripple effect that you know messes something else up mm. and uh so that was that was their department my department was like make it look good <laughs> <laughs> like i had some art i can tell i do comics you know like i'll, I'll do the comic book part of it but the game part is it's a whole art form and like there's they're uh it's great because jay and sen they're like they're super famous in board games you know like we can't walk around the game convention without people stopping them left and right and i was like i was like hey do you, you guys are like famous <laughs> it's it's kind of great where, where can our listeners find the my management board game um you'll be able to find it at retailers or on my website or online like starting in like august it's we just reprinted it so like august beginning of september um you'll be able to find it that sounds like, like it, it yeah me thinking i i, I want to i gotta check this out now <laughs> i definitely want to check out the board yeah. game <laughs> mm-hmm. so my management bootleg when does that number one issue arrive um i'm pretty sure july is when july. when it comes out but you can still order tell you gotta let your local shop know you want it and then uh i think the poly bag one with the the weird playing cards in them those are those are special they're a different kind they're not like mm-hmm. the main one so you might have to specify. When does the comic book with the cool fur cover come out? That one's going to be probably next year. Like that one, we're going to do as issues first and then collect it in the, hmm. in a, we can't do, we haven't figured out a way to do like floppy, regular floppy comics with fur covers because <laughs> it's too heavy. <laughs> um, but we, we were designing the, I'm designing, designing the covers uh, today. I was working on that with Tyler and the covers are going to be, they're going to be, <laughs> ridiculous they're kind of gross <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of funny so what, what other hints could you give our listeners to what could be coming else from uh, flux house in the near future yeah was, i'll just give hints but like spy there's an old there's a older spy book coming back that i'm redesigning and adding some stuff to and then there's a new spy book that i'm drawing that my wife charlene is painting with watercolors like similar to what we did with department h um, that's going to be coming out at the end of the year, December, um, issue one comes out and those are going to be like big fat 40 page issues, you know, where it's, that's, they're going to be fun. Mm. And, uh, and that, oh yeah, that book's going to have, um, this isn't an, they didn't, I'm not saying the title. So technically I'm not announcing it, <laughs> <laughs> but that those covers are going to be, uh, they're like paper bag, like grocery paper bag covers. 
So like there's a cover, but then we're wrapping it with like a grocery paper bag cover. Oh, so wow. Like it's disguised on the shelf. It's going to look like a like a piece of trash. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's like awesome. Like, who, left their, who left their bag on the, on the shelf? <laughs> anyway, but it's all to do with like the spy theme, sort of like trying to hide it in plain sight. Mm. I mean, that sounds awesome. I, I can't wait to um, check out um, my manager, Bulay. And now you got me thinking about the board game now. So August, the board game. I, I'm going to yep. find that out. <laughs> um, well, Mr. K, it was a total pleasure to talk with you, sir. I um, look forward to...